All right, welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Sunday, December 26, 26 2021. I hope everyone had a merry, merry Christmas yesterday. Hopefully you got to enjoy the day with your friends and family. Let's start off with some space weather news. First, our solar wind speeds coming in at 478.2 kilometers per second with a density of 5.5. Sunspot activity is still quite active. In fact, we're still looking at AR 2918, 2915, 2912, 2908, 2917, 2919, and last but not least, 2916. Now, I mentioned 2916 because it is growing at a pretty good rate right now. In fact, it is the Earth-facing sunspot that is at the very end of the loop of this sun that you're looking at here will be Earth facing. It's the very bright southernmost region here on the star. Not directly Earth facing, but just a couple of clicks to the left, you will see it becoming Earth facing. It is very large. It's quadrupled in size in just 48 hours. And they are kind of concerned with this one here. The size is quadrupled, turning into one of the largest sunspots of solar cycle 25. This 24-hour, this 48-hour uh, image here of the sunspot continues to grow as it turns towards Earth. AR 2916 has an unstable delta class magnetic field that harbors energy for a powerful X-class solar flare. If such an explosion occurs today, it would be Earth directed, potentially causing shortwave radio blackout and radiation storms. Now, that is not saying that it is going to happen today or the next 24 hours. It is just giving you the what ifs. Um, I am not seeing anything that is showing the possibility of an X-class flare today uh, but we have seen the data and this sunspot has grown quite a bit <clears throat> so we'll continue to look as of right now though I mean the class uh, of, of an M-class flare is more likely than the percentage chance for a, an X-class flare in fact right now it's point uh, I'm sorry zero one percent chance of an X-class flare but again it does contain properties that will um, that could possibly unleash an X class flare. Taking a look at cosmic radiation, I'm not really sure if this number is correct. 8.8% um, is what it's reporting, but that was the last report that we had on the last show we did. And if you guys have paid attention to us, this week has been or this month has been an up and down with the move and trying to do broadcast, but. So I'm not so sure if the cosmic radiation rates are correct, but they were reported at 8.8%. That's a 0.5% increase just in the last 48 hours. Again, <clears throat> we are expecting solar wind speeds from a corona hole that is uh, directly Earth-facing here soon. KP at 1, 24 hours out, also at a 1. So we will also watch for the possibility for some seismic activity over the next 36 to 48 hours. Could be anywhere from a 6 to a 6.7 earthquake, possibly even another volcano eruption, possibly. Let's take a look, a little deeper look at some more space weather facts over at the grandsolarminimum.com, our website here. And as you can see, the thing that really um, that really makes me believe that we are going to see a period of sunspot activity for a while. Whoa. I guess the dogs don't like that either. Um, the the thing that um, that makes me concerned about <clears throat> the possibility of sunspot activity carrying on for quite some time is because of where we are right now in our orbit position around the sun. If you notice, everybody else is hanging out on this side of the solar system. We talked about this before. Stronger magnetic connection from the sun to these planets because everything is focused over here. So the sun is focused its energy 
right now on this side of the plane. Over here, <clears throat> weaker magnetic field. So that means all that uh, energy that is built up underneath the sun's corona is a little weaker and will allow sunspots to appear more frequently on this side of the sun versus the, uh, this side of the sun. Are you guys with me? So Earth is getting ready to be all by themselves here for the next several months. So when we talk about X-class flares, it's really important to watch out during a time like this for an X-class flare because our magnetic field is at its weakest point. Over here, these blue lines indicate a, a very weak connection of the sun to the Earth. <clears throat> so... And does it get any better as far as sunspot activity? Well, let's take a look at that too real quick. I will first zoom this back down. We'll take a look at KP indices continuing to drop. So we have a coronal hole that we're going to be dealing with too, and I'll show you that just quickly. But first, let's look at what we have on the way. And this is the best way to look at this, really. Right here is the earth-facing coronal hole. Not very wide, but wide enough to show some concerns, possibly another one right behind it. And the pattern that we're looking at here is sunspot, 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 sunspot. This almost looks like the way a sun looks during a maximum. Yes, it is getting very, very active. But the question is, <clears throat> what's next? If we're seeing maximum activity starting now, we've talked about when a solar cycle ramps up, that also means that the time of minimum that we predicted will also come faster because of how quick the maximum activity came. Therefore, the decline will also be here earlier as well. So right now, we definitely look busy when it comes to sunspot activity. <clears throat> I don't see any reason for that to, to be relentless, like I said, or to, to stop for the very reasons that I said a minute ago, and that is because of where we are orbitally around the sun. And the sun's magnetic field itself is going to become weaker. The corona is going to become weaker. And I know this is confusing, but sunspots emerge because of plasma buildup underneath the corona and when the sun's corona reaches a certain stage in its strength that's when you start to see sunspots as long as it's been long enough for them to build up they start to appear and rightfully so it's been long enough so <clears throat> i really it would be surprised to see uh, a spotless day anytime soon from here on out I just don't see it on the horizon. So it is possible that we are seeing the uptick of this solar cycle. And watch its progression. But even so, the last time we went live, we talked about 144 was the peak. <clears throat> and that has sub since subsided down to the 128 area. Taking a look at solar end over the last couple of hours. So lots of stuff to watch here, folks. Again, the coronal hole that we are expecting right here doesn't look like much in this angstrom, but it does widen as it becomes earth facing. Again, earth facing right now is on the weaker side of its connection. All the magnetic strength is on the other side of this sun. So this makes sense to see this coronal hole widening. Now this is, like I said, I, I'd say seismic activity of a 6.1 to a 6.7 is very possible, and there could be a one-two punch as there is another decent-sized coronal hole right behind it. So we'll continue to watch this situation. Uh, could pop off a earthquake could pop off a volcano but one thing is for certain one volcano has finally wrapped up that's right folks the eruption at la palma has finally come to a close or so they have said with 85 days of eruptive process 
and 3,000 acres of land covered. This is now La Palma's longest eruption in 375 years of the island's historical data. The second longest eruption was of the Taiyu volcano, Taiyu Ya, I should say, in 1585, which lasted 84 days and covered only a third of the land that was covered from La Palma. So, about 7,000 people of the island's 83,000 were forced to evacuate. Luckily, no injuries or deaths have been directly linked to the eruption. Good news. No deaths, no injuries linked to this volcano. Now, the correlation, for me anyway, the fact that this was the largest eruption in the last 375 years. Now, why this is so significant is because of the last time this happened. This was during a grand solar minimum, and it was during a grand cycle. Not just any grand solar minimum, but the Maunder minimum. And the Maunder minimum is specified as a grand cycle. Just like this current grand solar minimum that we're going into is going to be considered the second grand cycle of the super grand solar minimum that we are currently in right now, according to the work of Valentina Zarkova. So to see such large volcano eruption in each grand cycle, the fact that during this grand cycle, we saw 3,000 acres of land covered by this explosion, lava flow, versus 1,000 in the last grand solar minimum, or the grand cycle, I should say. So much more lava flow from this current eruption. Does that mean that we are in a more intense grand solar minimum than we were in the modern minimum? No, but it's an interesting fact to see that this was a record-breaking eruption, and the last time that it happened was during the modern minimum. Just to see the historics line up as far as when these are supposed to happen. And this is just to me, I know everyone can say it's a coincidence all you want, but John Casey and others are trying to prove that volcano and seismic activity are indeed um, involved with uh, solar activity. <clears throat> so, and this is part of our proof, I believe. When I see the number 375 years ago, this happened is large. And here we are in a grand solar minimum, 375 years ago, was right around the time of a Maunder. Remember, grand solar minimum cycles, the grand cycles, happen every 350 to 415 years apart. So here we have an eruption from La Palma right now, the very beginning of this new grand solar minimum, and it broke the record of the last eruption in the last grand cycle. Kosovo's power system is already completely affected by global energy prices, forcing the country to introduce rolling two-hour blackouts for its 2 million people on Wednesday, December 22nd. Only emergency customers will stay unaffected. Kosovo introduces rolling power cuts as European energy crisis deepens. What's this all about, Jake? Well... This wave of electricity problems in Kosovo started after a unit at their main coal power plant malfunctioned last week, dropping the country's local power production to less than a third of consumption and forcing them to import electricity at extremely high prices. See what kind of planet we live on, folks? A major power source in another country had malfunctioned. So now this country, to keep its people warm, and we know it gets cold in Kosovo, now they are forced to pay expensive increased prices because of their misfortune. So to add injury to insult, rolling blackout, blackouts on top of high prices due to something out of their control. It's insane. Blackouts were first announced the last <clears throat> for the 24 hours, but were extended indefinitely on Thursday, December 23rd. Given that the energy crisis has already deepened in our country, and on the other hand, other factors such as overloads of power system, the, uh, the trend of rapid consumption growth, the decision was made to plan electricity restrictions continue 
into the following days. According to the plan, blackouts will continue to last about two hours for each group of customers at different times of the day. This phenomenon that is hindering the timely connection of certain groups is large load appearing at the end of each blackout. To eliminate this phenomenon, the cooperation of all is required. Consumers who are without electricity should have the electrical equipment turned off or disconnected from the outlet in order for the process of reconnection of each output be carried out successfully. As long as you have a scheduled time on when this was going to happen, sure, that would work. But they don't know. That's random for different sections. Um, and let's hope that it's during a time of the day where electrical consumption is low. And natural gas prices also in Europe are exploding to all-time highs as major Russian flow stops. That's right. Natural gas prices in Europe exploded on Tuesday. Now, this was the day before they announced these uh, blackouts here in Kosovo. After a major pipeline that brings Russian gas to Europe slowed output over the past couple of days and completely stopped delivering on Tuesday. This combined with record high prices of electricity after France closed four of its largest nuclear reactors last week, low wind energy output, and cold weather to further deteriorate Europe's energy stability ahead of a very cold Christmas and New Year. Yeah, by the way, France closed four, four nuclear reactors? Let's take a look here at what's going on here. The day before that article, December 20th, Euro European power prices surged to record highs over the past couple of days after France announced the closure of four of its largest nuclear reactors. The crisis is further exacerbated by already very high prices of natural gas and cold temperatures. By the end of the month, most of the continent will endure below average temperatures, further increasing power demand. Now let's find out why. French power giant EDF found two faults close to the welds on pipes for of the safety injection system in two reactors at Savo Power Plant last week. The company had stopped one reactor at the Savo plant for a routine tenure checkup in August, and in November it also halted a second reactor at the site. Uh, protectivity previously planning to restart it on Christmas Eve. <clears throat> However, as a result of the fault discovery, an outage at the plant will now last longer than expected, the company said, adding that it also would halt production in its plants and choose because it uses the same kind of reactor. The two facilities make up almost 10% of French nuclear capacity, and they are the biggest and newest units of 56 in the country. Nuclear power accounts for around 70% of the account of the country's electricity mix. The shutdowns will make the market even more jittery as temperatures are set to plunge way below average for much of the content. Here is your weather anomaly here. <clears throat> we do see a, a very cold Arctic blast creeping further and further south by the time we get to the end of the month followed by another quick warm blast as well going into the first of the year, but more cold air behind that front January 5th and moving forward. So this is not just happening here in Europe either. People are starting to get a little concerned about energy prices. Uh, we've read some interesting assumptions about how you could keep warm during a grand solar minimum in upstate New York. <laughs> Uh, some are suggesting that we need to keep 10 cords of wood on hand at all times. I'm starting to understand that if you want to keep your house warm to a certain degree. It goes through a lot of wood quickly. So, with people nervous about gas prices and energy prices, and you hear all this talk about how warm it's going to be and how it's global warming this and global warming that, and their fears now in Europe is that we are going to be experiencing so much colder weather coming up soon. And on top of the rolling blackouts, what else damage would that cause when you're losing power for a couple hours at a time? How long are these going to last? And at a time where wind production is down, 
the world looks to change the way they provide heat and energy by switching to solar and wind. And we are having so many problems with trying to convert this energy over to a, a, a situation where everyone's happy, the environmentalists are happy, the green people are happy, global warming people are happy, the, you know, the, the global cooling people are happy. But right now, with what's happening with our sun and our climate, which is just weather right now, it's not climate change, it's just weather, it happens. It gets cold, it gets hot. That's what it's doing right now. But we are looking at a pretty cold winter potentially on the way. And I always say when we see the kind of weather we see like right now, we're about two weeks away from the same thing, if not sooner. So energy prices here at home are not just going up, but across the world. Now, the article is talking about the pipeline that's cut off to you to the Europeans right now. There's a lot more going on than what this article is saying. Uh, we all know Russia is standing at the border right now of Ukraine, ready to invade. It's going to cut off a pipeline. They, they warned they were going to do this. They were going to cut off the natural gas supply to Europe. Nobody believed in they were going to, and they did it. And they did it. And so now the fun begins, folks. Here we are looking at a potential war overseas over the land and the resources of Ukraine because of what's coming, the grand solar minimum. Russia is trying to stockpile right now. They're not messing around with these Green New Deals and all these stupid new laws about um, banning gas-powered equipment to do your lawn work like they do here in New York. They're, that's on the books now. So no more gas-powered Leaf blowers, lawn mowers, mulchers, none of that. It's got to go bye-bye. It's absolutely I mean it, to me it's it's a little weird that all these problems are happening with these fossil fuel heat sources. It's almost like they're trying to test it, the dry run, to see how a green world would actually look with rolling blackouts. That's one way to reduce emissions, right, in their minds. And here's another one, another bonehead move, in my opinion. Two, two of them. Actually, let's do this one first. But for, uh, here, here, New York City chainsaws down 1,000 trees to raise park 8 to 10 feet to address panic over 3 millimeters of sea level ride. Protesters watched in horror. So they killed a thousand trees, folks, to help improve this park and to fight the, the sea level rise, which, by the way, is only three millimeters. But the thing that makes me absolutely crazy here at the bottom, the park was like, well, we're the parks department, so we're very fond of trees and plants, but... You know, there was 250 trees that died from all that intense saltwater inundation. So, there are species that were not designed for this kind of environment. As if he did a favor to these trees that were dying from the saltwater consumption. So, the 250 is justified. What about the other 750 trees? Now... Why am I going on about trees being cut down? Oh no, Jake's a tree hugging hippie. No, it's just facts, all right? If you're AGW, mainstream governmental people, you are telling everyone that we have to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere to help get our planet's um, climate back under control, right? What is the best way of absorbing CO2? Vegetation. That's right. Trees are one of the bigger um, protectors of our world. They, their leaves can get really thick and grow really big and absorb more CO2 when there is an abundance of nitrogen. Um, I'm sorry, not nitrous. Um, nitrogen in the bedrock and nitrogen in the atmosphere like there is during solar minimums. So this gives trees a chance to grow thicker leaves, absorb more CO2. Pull it out. 
pull all that CO2 out. Uh, how do you do that in New York when you chop down a thousand trees? Again, I never understood why they banned plastic bags here in New York and replaced it with paper bags. Sure, you create emissions when you create plastic bags. Sure. But again, when you replace the product that creates pollution and you replace it with products that help take pollution out of the air, it makes no sense. You might as well just keep the the plastic bags in check because it evens everything out. I know we got to worry about the sea turtles and the dolphins. I'm a big proponent of recycling. And I, I agree. But I just don't understand these climate laws where, you know, let's ban plastic bags, but replace them with paper bags. So we'll cut all the trees down in New York City, which has a lot of man-made emissions. But let's cut down the one thing that could suck carbon out of the atmosphere. It's It's almost like they know we're cooling, and they're trying to stop the cooling now by getting rid of things that will take even more carbon out of the atmosphere. It's mind-boggling. And then you have people in Japan blaming climate change for the shortage of french fries. That's right. Japan McDonald's reducing food portions, food portions even, because of climate change. They're blaming the floods in western canada for the climate change or the or the yeah the reason why the potato shortage is happening so they have to reduce their size to a small oh my gosh but guess what japan and mcdonald's are both saying that they don't even get their potatoes from western canada they're imported from north america or united states into vancouver which is then transported to Japan. So technically, they want to tell you that climate change is causing them to go to small fries. And then you find out that they don't even receive potatoes from the areas that are in question right now with the floods in B.C. in Alberta. And remember, we just had the worst drought in western Canada, followed by the worst floods in Canada. So. I'm just trying to help make sense of all this for everybody. Climate change means the climate is doing the opposite of what it usually does on a consistent basis. Am I correct? Basically, the basic fundamentals of climate change is that the climate changes. It used to be really hot and dry here. Now it's, now it's hot and wet. It's, it rains a lot now. That's climate change, right? No. When it rains a lot, after it's been dry for a long time, that's just the weather changing. It will get dry again. It'll get wet again. It doesn't happen every 30 years. It happens every year. Sometimes it happens every two years. The point I'm trying to make is the mainstream media is starting to fail to make the connection of climate change and why you're seeing the shortages you're seeing. They want to blame global warming to the problems of the climate crisis and why everything is so bad right now. But we are seeing a crisis that we didn't see in the summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere. We're seeing it here in the wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's energy costs. We didn't have to worry about energy costs in the summertime, blackouts in areas that aren't used to it. Business as usual, right, for the summertime. But when it's cold weather, it's different. Cold kills more. Cold kills more people than the hot weather does. That's facts. So all these problems that we're having right now, the government wants to cut off the fossil fuel industry completely and not use it for any energy, but nuclear reactors are, are down, wind power is down, solar power is down, and they want to cut your coal use and natural gas use. What is left? to supply power. What's left? Pixie dust? Are we going to you know pray to the tooth fairy to bring us clean energy? And then oh we already talked about this. So yeah, so you got you got people in New York City chopping down a tree because of of climate change because you know global warming, sea rise, 3 millimeters. Woo, watch out. 
They want to fight climate change. They want to get rid of carbon, but they cut down trees that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Makes sense. And then Japan has claims about the reason why they got small french fries is because of climate change and the, and the floods, the shortage of potatoes, but that's not the case at all. They don't even get their potatoes from Canada. They just happen to be imported to Vancouver and sent to Japan. So everybody trying to get behind that false narrative, trying to get you convinced that you're causing climate change. Mm-hmm. Just like Brandon got 81 million votes. Sure. More cold weather starting to ramp up across the United States. We've got cold and record snow happening in the Sierra. The snowpack is finally starting to really pick up out of here. Capacity right now, 28% in Shasta. This is the reservoir. Uh, historical average is 48%. So some of these numbers are down. This is much, much needed heavy snow at this time. Still low numbers here at Orville, uh, Don Pedro. A lot of areas down. So this is definitely welcomed uh, rain. But here we go. Rain in San Francisco last year, 7.25 inches through October through May. This year, from May until October 1st, totally different story. Double that. Double that. So very wet season in San Francisco. But again, a lot of these areas need the moisture. And it will continue to fall in the frozen form across the northwest. In fact, if you were watching football today, you saw the Bears and Seattle Seahawks game. That was the first really snowy game of the year. Sunday night into Monday night, you see the snow all the way in the northwest, across parts of Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and California, mainly along the Sierras, where we'll see the most heaviest of the snow. And here's what we're thinking in parts. Uh, that's in feet, folks, not in inches. So this right here is in feet, two to four feet of snow at Echo Pass, two to four at Donner, uh, two to four in Tioga Pass, and then of course areas in the northwestern parts a little bit lighter, two to three inch, two to three feet, but still they're getting pummeled right here, folks. They've already been getting feet, and it's still not enough because of how dry it got this summer out there. We got another storm system setting up across the United States. It's going to continue to trek across the Midwest. And it will bring ice and snow across parts of Chicago, Indiana, Iowa, Milwaukee, and Columbus. But look at the snowfalls right now. Very, very light across the Midwest. This snowstorm that's coming up here is going to try and change that over the next several days. But this one looks more like something of the Northern Plains, the Northern Great Lakes. Ice for you out there, Scott Rose. Watch out on this Monday, the system. And all rain for you folks in Ohio and mild conditions in Indiana, Illinois, and parts of Missouri Monday into Tuesday. So this little clipper system, Sunday into Monday, bringing a lot of heavy snow to the North Dakota region and northern Minnesota and the far northwestern corner of Wisconsin. 12 to 18 inches is possible in the northeastern parts of North Dakota. Some of you will get a foot out here. Most of you will get one to three inches in a widespread swath. And then this moves into Tuesday night. We start to see more ice across Detroit, Toronto, and then across parts of Buffalo into Syracuse and the Albany area. This is Tuesday night that system moves in. And yes, the Northeast does get a taste of the snow and ice. Here's where that storm picks up Monday. We'll have the ice running across western New York, and that system will continue to move east on Tuesday but it's not going to be like a typical northeastern pattern that we always see where this goes up into the northeast. Not the case. This is going to continue to head due east. Hopefully, Mari and I missed this because I don't like the ice. And we had enough of that on Christmas Day. In fact, let's take a look at GFS. The snowfall that we've had so far, more for parts of Colorado as we speak. Finally, you guys are starting to see some snow out there. This is for that snowstorm I was talking about. Actually, this is next week late, so let's go backwards here. That's late week next week. Here's Monday. Here's that next system moving in across the northern plains into the Great Lakes. Parts of New York will see snow, but this thing kind of fizzles out, changes over to freezing rain. This is Tuesday, December 28th. Snow to the north, rain to the south, and then another system builds up on Tuesday, December 28th, bringing another chance for snow and ice across western New York into Albany area, but stays east, does not travel north. 
and behind that will be a pretty decent cold front and another chance of snow by December 30th and 31st, New Year's Eve, to the New York area, Vermont, and that quickly moves out by Friday, New Year's Eve. Cold pressure or cold air in place, high pressure trying to dominate here, and by Saturday, January 1st, a pretty decent low pressure system forming across Nebraska. Uh, Matt Bros out there, you could see a few inches of snow from this. Northwest Kansas will definitely get a significant amount. Missouri, Wisconsin, and South Dakota also. But if you live in Lima, Ohio, southward, expect rain on this particular low pressure. Heavy pressure, heavy snow for the northern side of this, and heavy rain across the south southeast portion of the storm by Sunday, January second. It'll be snow and ice in parts of New York. All snow in the upper Great Lakes, and as the system moves out, it will change once again to freezing rain, but back to snow because of how strong this low-pressure front is. It's bringing, it's dragging in colder Arctic air and rushing it through, and that's why I think that that's what's causing this wraparound right here where the ISO bars are tight. That means it's going to be windy, and it's going to bring these winds down from the north heading south to south, or sorry, yes, heading west southeast so if that makes any sense uh counterclockwise rotation that cold air is going to rush down on monday january 3rd <clears throat> and change this precip back over to snow i don't expect a huge amount of snow but it could be enough to make it a messy commute in the morning on monday lake effect snow is hanging around for parts of the finger lakes and western new york the south towns of buffalo and then more moisture coming in for the northwest as if they haven't had enough already you will see more snow more rain Northern California, heavy, 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 heavy snow to develop once again over the Sierras by the first week of January. So this wet, cold pattern across the Northwest, these atmospheric rivers are just not going to stop, folks. It does not look like anytime soon. Our next major chance of snow across the United States doesn't look like it happens till January 8th unless you live in the Northwest. A brief clipper system to reach the Northeast before some mild conditions settle in. And then a giant cold front right behind this system here on January 10th. Again, these low pressure storms, they're starting up way higher. Okay. And that's part of the La Nina situation, La Nina's jet stream. This is kind of a good thing if you don't like snow, because all this really heavy stuff usually is going through Ohio into New York and up to Maine. But these are staying up pretty north. These storms are getting started further north. And it's bringing mostly just rain right now. I'm not complaining as usually. We're shoveling a lot by now. But this system here does start off as rain in the northeast. Changes to snow. Again, another big cold front behind it. And just blowing in cold air across the Great Lakes. Lake effects finally take a calmer stance by Tuesday, January 11th. But we're going to see that really cold temperatures starting to really build in across the north for sure. By the first week of January, you guys out here, I, I just, we got to watch this situation first. It was up here. Now it's moved south a little bit. We are seeing tons of moisture, lots of rain, lots of snow. We'll continue to monitor that situation as well. We'll look at the temperatures real quick. This is what I'm saying here. That cold Arctic air trying to make its way down into the lower 48. It's pushing, it's pushing. Here's that last gasp of mild air across the U.S. on January 3rd. And look at that cold Arctic blob trying to invade the Northeast. Some of it does actually reach parts of the Northeast. Mainly the Northern Plain states get drilled with lots of cold Arctic air. And then another big cold front coming in behind that. By the end of the first week of January, we are going to see one more mild push here. It looks like going the ridge and frizz. But look at this ridge and fridge, I should say. Wow. So if you're a fan of cold air, it's coming. It's flirting with us right now. And it is building up around the Arctic. In fact, well, let's look at the snowfall. What are we looking at here for the rest of this month? This is into New Year's Day. Not bad. Lots of snow on the ground. Most of the country will have snow on the ground again. Let's move it forward to the 2nd of January. More snow added to the Northeast. More snow again to, wow, Wisconsin, upper part of Michigan. Of course, the Northwest is going to be just destroyed feet of snow 
if I'm not mistaken, I'm seeing a reading here that says 96 inches of snow. Wow. In parts of Oregon, 74 inches. Just absolutely crazy numbers that we're going to see in the northwest Oregon, Washington, Northern California. Very, very epic and record numbers heading that way. And really, if you look at the upper Great Lakes, Wisconsin, Michigan, northern parts, now starting to see that heavier snow. Parts across the northeast also starting to see more snow. So as we get further and further into 2022, the real cold begins to kick in. And I have to wonder how warm we're going to be able to stay if prices continue to go up. And we have to make a decision on do we keep the thermostat at 63 tonight? Because, man, last week's he- last month's heating bill was $450. This- these are some real decisions on top of inflation and food prices going up, and energy prices going up, gas is high. If you don't have a plan, folks, for Grand Solar Minimum, now's the time. We're running out of time to make plans. We have to start putting these plans in action. We got to prep for this cold weather that's coming. We got to prep for this weather that we're going to see. Challenges to our climate, heavy rain, heavy snow, floods, famine, crop failures, you name it. The next 30 to 40 years are going to be a a wild ride. I can guarantee you that. MSM is going to hijack it and call it climate change. Folks like you, though, you know this is just a part of a natural cycle that our sun goes through. I want to say hello to a few people out there. Knife Collector, thank you as always for being in the chat and modding for us. Shirley Davis, good to see you out there. Arnold Schmidt, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, Kelvin, hello. J Dog, good to see you out there. Brian, okie dokie there, fella. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Very enthusiastic gardener, hello. Both of us are nursing football wounds today, I know. And lots of other new faces out there. Of course, hello to my beautiful wife, Mari. Hello there, my love. Folks, uh, as you know, we've completed the move. Content will begin to steadily or slowly increase from this channel. Tonight we did an update. Tomorrow, probably not Tuesday night, probably. So we're going to start trying to get uh, more updates throughout the week. Because there's really a lot to watch right now with the sun, especially with the sunspots, the X flares possible. Uh, we got solar wind coming. We've got possible CMEs coming. Just lots of things to get into. Plus, it's going to be the heart of the winter here very soon. Lots of cold and snow to report on. So this is the busy season for us, and you will continue to see the number of shows per week increase as we head into 2022. It's going to do it for me to, tonight, folks. Again, Merry Christmas to everyone out there. We hope everyone has a safe weekend. We will talk soon. Take care.